I'm 15 years old and I had to convince adults to come back to the church because they like aren't coming anymore. Oh, wow. And I would have this list of people to call and I would call them and I would get sworn at, I would get hung up on. They're probably being harassed, all of yeah. these people who I'm calling. And I'm just like, why do people seem to hate Scientology so much? I don't understand, red flag. But like I said, I have other cadet friends, a lot of them with misspelled names, wrong birthdays, things like that. I was horribly neglected as a child. And I was forced to lab a hard labor and no education. And my mom said, when I said to her, I've been working on writing, she said, you better not be writing about Scientology. That was her first reaction. It is what it is. How I was raised was, was how I was raised. And I just want people to form their own opinions about it. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high-demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. As always, if you're only listening and you want to see our faces, you can go to our YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness. It would mean the world if you could become a subscriber, a supporter, an advocate for these people who are bravely coming on and sharing their stories. We would not have a podcast without them. So today's guest, she was referred to me by Erin from Growing Up in Scientology. Thank you. Aaron for the referral. And she grew up in the Sea Org. Her parents were in it. She was literally born into it. She became a cadet and then eventually a Sea Org member. And so we're going to be talking about what that was like growing up in that lifestyle at the ranch, at the different Sea Org places, and how she had to navigate that as a child and kind of grow up a little bit too fast and eventually start rebelling and what that looked like when she did start rebelling. She has a whole book about it called The Bad Cadet, which you guys can go check out after this. I've been listening to the Audible version. It's great. And so thank you so much for joining us, Catherine Spolino. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here and share my story. Yeah, it's great to have you. So I'm I'm really glad we connected. I think it's interesting that you were a cadet. And I'm, I'm going to get... I'm going to get you to describe what exactly that means when we get to that point, because this is the first time I've spoken to anyone who's been in that branch of Scientology. I think it's really interesting to hear that whole perspective. But first, we have to start with the origin story, right, which is where you're born. And I find it really interesting how that all played out and how that affected you a little bit later in life. Absolutely. So lately, if people have been on YouTube or on TikTok, they've been seeing a lot of Scientology buildings in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And I was born in one of those buildings in Hollywood where it's like the stars are right beneath the building and it says a big green sign. It says Scientology right on the building. I was born in one of those rooms with the midwife and unbeknownst to me, I never got registered. So I didn't have a social security number. I don't find this out till later when I'm 10 or so. And there's a whole chapter in my book about it. Because when I'm, I'm a cadet, I actually get paid as if I'm an adult, but I can't get paid because I don't have a social security number. So it becomes like this strange situation that I'm in where my parents, because they're so busy being working for the Church of Scientology, they never got around to registering me. That's so interesting. Something so crucial, especially having that happen here in the States in an organization who seems pretty locked in. I mean, we're not talking about an Amish population, which we've done interviews with before. You are in LA, you're in Hollywood, and you still don't have a social security number. I find that so fascinating. Yeah, it's absolutely bizarre because I wasn't the only one too, it turned out. I didn't find anyone else who didn't have a social security number, but there were other of my friends who are cadets who we compare stories. They all look at their birth certificate and find out their names are not correct, that they thought they had their whole life. So like I have a friend, she actually has a C in the middle of her name instead of a Z. She actually tattooed the her spelling that she grew up with just because it's so annoying. Thought her name was always told wrong to her. What? So she was taught to spell her name wrong from the birth certificate, but that's her name and she doesn't want to lose that name. That is so crazy. Yeah. Now, do you think a lot of this has to do with the fact that they don't prioritize children? In fact, L. Ron Hubbard says children don't really exist. They're just old souls in small bodies. Do you think that has anything to do with it? Yeah. So we're adults in small bodies is how we were taught. So for those who are listening who don't know, a cadet, which is what I was, our parents worked for the Church of Scientology, like in the inner inner circle of it. They signed a billion year contract, giving their life to the Sea Org and in turn mine as well. So I was literally born in the Sea Org. 
And I had started signing contracts by the time I was six years old, 10 years old, like saying, yep, I'm, I'm a Sea Org member. That's my purpose. And we were put in a boarding school. I was not raised with my parents. So I was raised with my friends who also have wrong spelling names that we don't find out till later. By the time I'm eight years old, I'm living away from my parents at a boarding school in the mountains above Los Angeles. And I see my parents very rarely. It becomes like once every few months. Sometimes they go to Florida for flag, the big headquarters, and I'm in Los Angeles. So I wouldn't see them for a year. And it was just normal. Like I thought that was normal. Yeah. So what are your earliest memories? Because you said you left for the boarding school at eight. So what do you remember prior to that? Were you involved with them at all? Would they check in on you? Were you just completely raised by other staff members? Yeah, I was raised by other staff members in a dorm in Los Angeles called the Anthony Building. It's on Fountain Avenue. And my dorm mom was the one who was in charge of getting me to school. There was 16, 13 to 16 other girls in my dorm at a time with three bunk beds, like stacked high, all crammed in a room. And we would all just get ready together. And then we would walk to what's called the pack base, which is also in Los Angeles, about six blocks away. And there was a little school across the street from the Church of Scientology. And we would all go there for the day and do learning how to read and so on. But we'd already be starting the Scientology processing and indoctrination at that time. They would do something called Chinese school where we would just like repeat back words. The teacher would say words like backflash, an unnecessary response to an order. And we're like five years old saying like backflash, an unnecessary response to an order. And we would do that every day. There was some sort of Scientology word or term that we would be learning verbatim and repeating back and we would shout it over and over, which is a form of like an indoctrination. Another thing that was starting at that young age is once a week, they would take us to the L. Ron Hubbard Life Exhibition and we would see all of this information about L. Ron Hubbard. I have a chapter about it. It's the second chapter in my book about how much we adored L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology, because Every week we would see these amazing accolades this exhibit of him. It's a museum, literally like a museum that they walk through and they show all the wonderful works of L. Ron Hubbard. And as a child of five, six, seven, I was probably even going up four, but I don't have those memories. And everywhere around me are, are big pictures of L. Ron Hubbard and a bust of him, you know, a statue. So to me, he was like a god like this all-knowing person who knew everything about the world. Oh, that's so interesting because it's it's almost religious, but then it's not. It's kind of like you have a prophet, but it wasn't put into those terms. Mm-hmm. But you did say that you saw him like a god. Did you think that he had special powers? I thought that he knew everything that there was to know. And I did think he had special powers because he's called OT, which means OT is like an operating Thetan. So they consider like our body is our body and then your spirit is your Thetan, like who you essentially are. They have a whole system in Scientology that you're trying to move up what's called the bridge. And if you get to OT, the higher up you are, the more powerful you are. And he had created all these levels and was at the top. He had like OT 13 or something. I think people only could get to OT8 now, like he's like above. And that means he can change things like, oh, the weather's bad. I'm going to postulate that it's going to get good. We grew up with postulating instead of praying. Even though we weren't OT yet, you still have that power of trying to change things with your thought force, you know? So like a higher OT you are, you'd probably be able to change things even more. But like there would be so many times you'd be like, okay, kid, we're going to go do this, but we need the rain to go away. Everybody postulate that the rain's going to go away. Like that would be a version of praying basically now when I look back at it. But except for we're not praying to anybody, we're praying, we're just putting out our own power. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's so interesting. I remember there was a part in your book where I think you were talking about your dad and you're like, oh, my dad has these special powers, which were because he was at a certain level OT3 where he could essentially, at least according to what you were taught, read minds or change stoplights or change the weather. Am I getting those details right? Yeah, that's right. So that's all I was told. It was very vague was that OT levels are really powerful beings. So when I would see my dad, I describe him in the book, but he was kind of overweight, you know, like balding head, very mellow personality. And I'm just like, huh, this doesn't seem like what an OT person would be. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I'm like, I guess maybe there's subtlety to it, you know? (laughs) That's so interesting because when you get to that level and they tell you that you're going to have these special powers and I don't think that they actually get any special powers, how are these people getting around that? Are they saying, oh, I just must not be clear enough or how? 
I guess, how do people not connect the dots that they're not getting special powers from climbing the bridge? That's a very good question. I think that a lot of them just believe, you know how you, good things happen to you, good luck. But if you're like, you claim that luck as your power, you know, everybody's like, oh, I hope I get all the green lights on the way to work. And you get all the green lights and you're just like, yes. Well, for them, they're like, oh, I made that happen. Got it. Like they can claim that power. Just confirmation bias. Exactly. And now knowing like how many Scientologists who get sick and die of cancer, like how do you explain that away? Because one thing OT levels promises like to get rid of sickness, but somehow they still do. I think they probably just say, oh, this body's done with this earth and we're ready to move on to our next plane. Because that's another thing they believe in is that these bodies are not that important. And if you want to translate that back to me as a child, if my parents are thinking, oh, this time on our on earth, we've had so many lives and this is just a body like, oh, my daughter chose this body. She chose to be a cadet. So she's fine in this boarding school being raised to be a seer member. Like that's what she wants to do. They have little to no involvement in raising me. That must have felt pretty isolating unless you really didn't know a difference. I guess as I'm saying it out loud, a lot of people will say, well, it was fine because I didn't realize that I was supposed to spend time with my parents because I was isolated from the rest of the world. Did you have any sort of peek into, I guess you could call it like a quote, regular kid's life where you're seeing kids play with their parents on the streets? Or did you realize that you were different at all? Yeah. So there's this journey I take um, as I'm growing older eight, nine, I'm still perfectly happy in my life situation. I think I am aware by then that we are in a special school, but by the time I'm 10 or an 11, I'm reading books about like Sweet Valley High or even Goosebumps. All of these books I still had access to, which I'm so grateful they didn't take away regular books because that from there was how I got exposed to this other outside world. And that's when I would start to be like, oh, it kind of sounds nice to not have to be working out in the fields, which is what I would be doing. Like de weed whacking is what we called it because we have to make a fire break. So if there was a fire at our ranch, we were protected. Like I'm doing this at eight years old, nine years old. I'm working in a galley. I'm doing Scientology studies alongside with regular school, but not enough regular school. I know now to compensate for what I should have been learning. So when I'm juxtaposing what I'm reading in these books and also movies, we were able to watch a movie once a week. If your production was high enough or the stats were high, you got org awards, it was called on Saturday night, and we would watch a movie. And again, I could see these comparisons and we loved the teen movies by the time we were 11, 12, 13, like 10 things I hate about you and can't hardly wait. Oh, I made high school look so fun. Even the bullying part, <laughs> it all looked like so dramatic. It looks so fascinating and fun to me. And that's when I actually begin to question whether or not I want to be in the CR because I just want to have fun. And that's a personality trait of mine <laughs> that, that cannot be squashed. Yeah, it seems throughout your book, when you're talking about going to the ranch at eight, that you were highly motivated to be a great Scientologist and you were highly motivated to eventually join the Sea Org and that's why you wanted to be a cadet. So maybe take me through those years of your life where you were just determined to do it right and you had a plan and you were kind of thrilled to be there. Yeah, eight years old, I randomly get pulled aside at the school that we were at called ATN LA and they're like, you get to go to the ranch. And I'm like... I get to go to the pack ranch, it's the cadet org. That's where my older sister is, who I rarely ever see. She's six years older. I am so excited. And they just like, yep, pack your bags. I don't remember saying goodbye to my parents at all. Like I just got in a car and left. That's how nonchalant it was. And I went with my best friend at the time and we arrive at the school and I'm just like, I can't believe we're gonna be cadets. We're ahead of our other friends because our other friends were still at the ATA. We were like two of the youngest coming to the ranch. Turns out her mom was the cadet coordinator of the ranch, meaning she was in charge of it. So she probably wanted her daughter there. And then her daughter picked a friend and I got pulled along. But at that time I felt special because I rarely ever got singled out. It's not like anyone's checking in on me, nurturing me. Mm. So for me, I'm like, I get to be first. And so all I want to do when I'm there is be a good cadet. It's important for me to tuck on my shirt, look really good. And of course, you know, literally the next day I get a lice check and I have lice. And that's my first introduction <laughs> to being a cadet. And I'm like ostracized yeah. or I feel ostracized because when you have lice, yet this day is separate from everyone. And I'm just so mortified. I remember I was wearing this hot hoodie sweater with the hood up, even though it was like a hot summer day. 
and I was sweating because I didn't want anyone to get any lice from me. And I had poofy hair that was like impossible to pull lice out of. (laughs) But yeah, to answer your question though, like as I'm growing up, that was eight. But by the time I'm 11, I'm still a very rule follower overall, overall I am besides being like a silly kid till like I'm like 12, 13. Then I start to, even then I still want to be a SEAG member, want to be a SEAG member. And then once I actually go on what's called the EPF, it's the Estates Projects Force. And it's like a boot camp for children to join the Sea Org. So I was 14 years old. I was randomly told, okay, it's you get to join the Sea Org. You've gotten your A, B, and C certs, they call it. They said it was equivalent to a high school education. It wasn't. It was like eighth grade level, if that. So just like that, leave, get in the car. Drive. It's like always a little fanfare, like off you go. So I go and join the Sea Org, but I'm on the EPF. And on the EPF is when I start to run into trouble because I am 14 and I really like boys and there's a lot of cute boys on the EPF and I can't help flirting with them and I keep getting shamed for that. They say, get your valence in, which means like get your Sea Org personality on, stop messing around and joking around. And that continues for a couple of years where I finally joined the Sea Org and I'm always just getting yelled at for being too loud too rambunctious. And I also kind of skip out on Scientology studies. I'm kind of doing what kind of normal teenagers might be doing. um, But except for I'm in a cult environment where there's all these rules. And at one point, I am standing at muster. Keep in mind, I'm only 14 years old, 15 years old at this time. And I'm in line with probably a quarter children my age, and then all adults, and we're all treated the same. We all have posts. And some of the 16 year olds are like posts that are executives telling adults what to do in this organization because age does not matter. And I'm standing there and all of a sudden they're like, we have an interrogatory going out and they pass out a piece of paper to everybody. I'm like, Ooh, who is this on? Like an interrogatory is bad. That means they're going to be asking everybody all the bad things that you do on that person. And everybody has to write it up. You're not allowed to keep it secret. And I look down and it's on me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I was so mortified. Um, When I get called into the ethics area, which is the place you go to when you're in trouble, they're like, everybody tells us that you're always in the bathroom putting on makeup, that you're always goofing off, that you're not in course, you don't take your post seriously. And I just feel like so ashamed. I feel like the whole organization knows that I'm such a bad Sea Org member and I'm like, I feel so bad about it. And so then like I knock myself into shape, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm going to be better. I'm going to be more robotic. I'm not going to be loud. And then this cycle kind of starts to take a toll on me. And at some point I have to choose, am I going to stay or am I going to go and this like leave the Sea Org? But where am I going to go? My parents are in the Sea Org. And all I've heard my whole life is up this outside world. They call them WOGs, which is turns out was a derogatory term that Albert Hubbard made up. Calling anybody who doesn't know about Scientology a WOG means that they're like kind of stupid. Like they don't know any better. Like we know all the answers and they don't. So I'd be joining all the WOGs, probably flipping burgers somewhere. That's like what they'd like to say. Or you're going to be promiscuous. You're going to end up on drugs. You're not going to have a lot of money because you're leaving the good place, you know? And I have to try to decide, is it worth it for my own freedom of self? Or should I just be working in the Sea Org? And may I add the jobs that I had in the Sea Org were very tedious, boring, pointless jobs where I had no like excitement or joy in it either. So I luckily was able to be like, oh, hell no. And I did leave. As you could see, I'm not yeah. <laughs> not a spoiler because I'm out. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. I mean, before we get to the leaving, because there's so much to talk about. What were some of the jobs that you had in the Sea Org? So just paint us a picture of the daily life of you. First job they give me is called a rudiments registrar. And rudiments is like when you're going to be getting auditing, which is the process that Scientology uses to help people clear their mind to become more OT, we'll say, or become clear. The rudiments is what you have to have so that you're like happy, you're doing good and doing well. So a rudiments registrar has to help public parishioners who have bad rudiments, meaning they're like not coming on course. They don't want to be there anymore. They're kind of blowing church is what you call. My job is to call them and try to get them back in. I'm 15 years old and I had to convince adults to come back to the church because they like aren't coming anymore. And I would have this list of people to call and I would call them and I would get sworn at, I would get hung up on. They're probably being harassed, all of these people who I'm calling. And I'm just like, why do people seem to hate Scientology so much? I don't understand. 
you know, like red flag, but I, I couldn't, I didn't really understand it. I'm like, they must have what's called a MUs, misunderstood words. Cause in Scientology, they believe if you go by words, you don't understand whether it's like L. Ron Hubbard words or any words. If you have too many words, you could blow or leave the space. So that's how I could justify like why all these people were so angry that I was calling. So that was my first post for a few months. And like within a couple of weeks, I was already hating it. And I would try to pass the time. Like I would call five parishioners, get hung up, yelled at on. I never had any success. Ugh, I would give myself a timer, doodle for a minute, and then I'll do another five calls. So I was definitely like having to push myself to try to work because it was just so pointless. But a big highlight for me was we got to go to a parishioner's house. And I thought that was so exciting. We went in the church's car and one of the cadets who was posted with me actually had a driver's license, which was unusual. It's really hard to get the time to go to driver's school and actually get a license. But anyway, so then he was able to drive and me and my other friend who's the rudiments auditor. So she would actually audit these Scientologists if they were wanting to come back, give a free auditing session to try to hook them back in. And she's my age too. She's 15 years old. She's already trained to be an auditor. We get in the car and we drive to this house and we get there, no one's there. And me and my friend are just like, where is the person? And the person I was with, who's like our boss, was like, oh, they're not here. We're like, wait, are we just showing up to people's houses? And I'm just laughing, thinking it's funny. He's like, shh, stop. <laughs> He's like peering in the window. Oh my gosh. And I thought it was so funny to me. And then we went to Office Depot to pick up supplies for the organization. And there's a cute guy there. And he's like showing me the aisles and all the, the things we need. And I was like, oh my gosh, he's totally like flirting with me. And I'm like, too bad he's not in the sea or I can't <laughs> date him. Right. And then we're like, get in the car. And I'm like, so bummed. I'm like, oh, I just want to hang out off his depot, like highlight of my month. Yeah. What is this doing to your mentality when you have to call adults and they're screaming at you or hanging up on you? Because I find it interesting and it's brilliant in like a dumb way that <laughs> L. Ron Hubbard just makes it seem like well, they blew because they didn't understand words. And so it's like dumbing people down to the the smallest level, the infantilization of people who leave. So it makes you as a member feel bigger and better and smarter. And so I wondered what that would do to the mentality of a teenager who's like, well, they just don't get it. <laughs> Were you having those thoughts? Yeah, you totally get it. Like that's exactly what they do is they make people who are doing something wrong. There's something wrong with them and there's not something wrong with you, the person working hard in the church. They had MUs and they didn't clear them and they blew. And that's like, we're still going to try to help them and give them a free auditing session to get them back in because they need our help. Yeah. But it's their fault that they did that. And then even it goes further. If you make a lot of mistakes on your post and you, and you get removed, there's a lot of shaming that goes along in, in Scientology. People will write reports on you. It's very big brother. Like your husband will write a report on you if they feel that you're saying something negative about the church or the Sea Org or if you're like complaining like, oh, I had to stay up till midnight to get this work done. They will write a report on you thinking like, oh, she's she's going down the wrong path. I need to help them. Thinking they're like helping you. This is a sense of righteousness that everybody has in the Sea Org of like helping yeah. and they're reporting on each other. It's very, very scary. <laughs> like how bad it is. Yeah. Were you doing reporting? Do you remember mm -hmm. wanting to, I guess, let me back up because I've interviewed some people like Claire Headley, for example, I think she would say, that it was better for her to write someone up because it made her look better. And maybe it wasn't her. I hope I'm not putting words into her mouth. But I feel like someone has said that along the way in these Scientology interviews that it kind of puts you in better in a better position if you're willing to tell on people. So it creates this environment where everyone just is motivated to do that because they want to be in a better position. Is that the case? Yes, absolutely. Everybody writes reports on each other. I did it on my friends, especially if I was feeling vindictive. But when we were really young, when we were at the ATA, five, six, seven years old, we would just take it to the next level. Like if we, we were mad at somebody, like, you know, little kid wars, all of us would write a KR on them. What? A knowledge report, right? <laughs> yeah, a knowledge report. And so that goes all the way up to the ranch. By the time we're at the ranch, I think some of us are starting to know the system a bit. 
and you know who will write a report on you and who won't. You know, you always have your tattletales. And there was quite, a, there's a lot of tattletales though. There's probably a higher amount than normal because that's what they're trained to do. They're trained to write reports since we're at a young age. I was a little bit rebellious in that I didn't really, I only wrote reports if somebody was pissing me off. <laughs> <laughs> like this kid, he was supposed to fix my bike that was gifted to me because I was too poor to have my own bike, but somebody gave me one because they were going to a different cadet org. So they gave me their bike and then it, the tire popped and this kid was supposed to fix it. And I gave him 20 bucks to do it, which was like hard. Like I had like no money and he just dismantled the whole bike. So then I wrote her a KR on him. Yeah. Guess what happened? Nothing. <gasps> Nothing okay. happened. Nobody cared. <laughs> that was a legit reason for a report. Yeah. Why do you think no one did anything? Because it seems like people were getting auditing sessions for things that they didn't even do and they were forced to admit to. I think that the the ranch was over, there was like 200 some kids and like 10 staff members, adult staff members. So like, who cares about a bike, right? Like they, they have bigger, like if you're doing things to disrupt the whole group, that's important. Not this girl who lost her bike. Like they probably filed in the ethics folder, but I don't think anything happened or I wasn't told of anything. Yeah. 200 kids and 10 adults seems like a recipe for disaster. How did they keep everybody in line? Did they have punishments other than auditing sessions? Uh, they kept us in line because we actually ran ourselves. We had a commanding officer who was like a 13 to 14 year old kid and then eight head division heads, seven division heads, division one, division two, division three, and they would all be cadets. And then they would have their little kids. So we would all run each other kind of like if you picture a camp, except for we're way younger and there's less adults around. So that kind of kept us in line. Cause like you, you were used to getting orders from like an older cadet. But if you got too many KRs, you would get put on what's called the ECG, the Ethics Correction Group, which was what happened to me, of course, because I wanted to skip what's called Source Night, which is when we listened to a lecture by Elrond Hubbard and go hang out with my boyfriend, I was 12, at the berm, which is by a certain area of the ranch. I got caught. I wrote a note to him and he got caught holding it in the course room. So then they call me to the office and they put me on the ethics correction group. I get screamed at, called names by the cadet coordinator at the time, and then put on this ethics correction group, which means I have to go move out of my dorm and go live with other out ethics cadets. We work in a trailer. We have these like two double wide trailers in the field of our school. And that was orally insulated. It was pretty cold in the in April in the mountains. And we'd be like shivering and like a little space heater and we'd writing our overts and withholds, which is like confessional, like write all of the things that you've done that is bad. We know what we'd have to eat after everybody else. And sometimes all the food would be gone. So you'd have to eat the leftovers. So you're like completely isolated from everyone. And meanwhile, reading Scientology ethics programs about how to fix how you're thinking or how you're acting. So that was something that every cadet would go through some sort of version of that at some point. And so you constantly are correcting yourself to be a better cadet. And then you have to ask permission from the whole group at the end of it. Can I rejoin the group? Because I've done all of this amends. I've dug up hours and hours of horse manure and put it away. I've gone in the outback behind the school and dug up like compost for our gardens. These are all the things I've done to make up for the damage of me writing a note to my boyfriend during SARS night. I do that. Like that's for like a month that I was doing all that. A month of punishment for passing a note? Yeah. And my friend did it too. And she doesn't get in trouble because they say she has ethics protection, but it's because she's not as sassy as me and they like her. And she was like blonde, cute, adorable, um, <laughs> and very like teacher's pet. And we did the exact same thing. And they're like, oh, her note wasn't caught. I guess her boyfriend at the time, I say boyfriend loosely. They didn't have a note, but it's like, you know that she did it too. So technically she'd be in trouble. They're like, she has ethics protection. Her stats were up last week. I'm like, so my stats were up. They're like, stop arguing, Catherine. Oh, wow. I want to know how they got around the labor law with children because you said that you couldn't get paid because you didn't have a social and they were actually taking taxes out of your $15 a week paycheck. So how did they get away with this? I don't know. I wish somebody would do some investigating, but they did it for the 90s and early 2000s or all the way back to 70s and 80s are stories of people on the free one ship and Sea Org ships because the Sea Org is called the Sea Org because it used to be Alvin Hubbard and all of his minions were on these ships trying to avoid being taxed. So they would be like not on land and they're called Sea Org members. And now we're all on land, but they he would have 
children, like at my age at that time, 12, 14, being his Commodore's messengers, even then, and not getting paid and just, or getting paid that small stipend. And for me, I was unusual that I didn't even get that stipend. It, they called it a paycheck though. I'm calling it a stipend because it was not a lot of money, but I just got unlucky. And again, nobody's looking out for me. Like I told my parents, like randomly, they just stopped paying me. And I'm like, what's going on to the treasury secretary, which is a 12 to 13 year old child. And they're like, I don't know. Your, your name's not in here. You don't have an envelope. I don't know. I'm like, well, can you find out? And they're like, fine. Cause they're a child. And then they go and investigate and like the next week, I'm like, did you find out? They're like, oh, they said, you don't have a social security number. You have to talk to the adult at the main office. And then they tell me to call my mom and I tell my mom and she's like, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I'll figure that out. But she doesn't have any time, right? She's like working from eight o'clock till 10 p.m. every day. And she does Scientology studies for a little few hours in that time chunk, but 12 hours, her whole day is is totally scheduled up till bedtime at 10. And sometimes you don't even go to bed at 10 because the orgs, they all make up reasons like, we're all down stat. Everybody needs to stay on post an extra hour and work harder. It's so hard to file things with the government. As we all know, like it's a time consuming thing. So it took her months to get it done. I'm surprised she even managed to do it, but she should have done it faster, honestly, because I was broke. I had no shoes at one point. I was walking around barefoot. There's nobody to look out for me and nobody cares, I guess. And that was just the way it was. Yeah. One of the moments that stood out to me, it kind of broke my heart a little bit, was when you were getting made fun of because you only had one pair of underwear. And they were like, oh, my gosh, you don't change your underwear? And it broke my heart because that's that's not something that any child should ever have to go through and then be ridiculed about it publicly. And it just the shame, I'm sure, that you felt just for something that's so simple. Yeah, it was so embarrassing. And I ran away following that incident because... I'm like, I just want to go to a different place. Of course, like I'm just being shamed and it's something I can't control. I have no money to buy underwear. And I tried to, it's another chapter in my book. I tried to get to LA and I don't know what's going to happen next. I'm only 12. But in my brain, I'm like, if I can get to my parents and just tell them, I know that we have relatives in New York, maybe I can go live with them. That's how sh ashamed I felt. And you'll have to read in the book to find out if I make it to New York. <laughs> no, I don't make it to New York. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert. Yeah, it's interesting that you still had so much faith in your parents. It didn't it doesn't feel like, and it didn't feel like when I was listening to your book, that you had any sort of resentment or animosity. You genuinely thought that they wanted the best for you, even though they weren't really raising you. Were there reasons for that? Did they give you reason to have a good relationship or maybe just explain your relationship with your parents a bit? I think I one thing I didn't mention is that my mom was a dorm mom when I was in the dorms when I was a five and six year old. So I got to see her in glimpses throughout the day. She was not my dorm mom. She had younger children in her charge and she would take care of those kids. And I was with a different dorm mom. But when I would just see flashes of her and I would give her hugs, my mom is a very warm, loving spirit. Even like other cadets are like, of all the adults, your mom was nice. Cause a lot of us did not like the adults really growing up. They were just people like figures, but they were not warm people that we would go to. They were just the people telling us what to do. So I just had, I, even though my mom wasn't actively taking care of me, I felt a nurturing sense from her. And we would have Sunday mornings, at least till I was about eight years old when I went to the ranch and we would get to hang out. So those Sunday mornings, even though it was just going to the laundromat down the street and maybe getting ice cream at the thrifties was very like important to me. And my dad was just a guy, like, I don't know. He was a nice guy, but I, it was nice to have somebody to write letters to when I was at the ranch and they would write letters back. I, I think because it was happening all around me, all of my friends had the same situation with their parents for the most part, unless you are only child. On the only child ones, they would get a little bit more spoiled. Their parents would come up every other weekend because that's how often you can visit because like it's their only child. I'm one of four. And also my parents are from poor families. So they didn't have money that's outside of the Sea Org at hand. Like there were families in the Sea Org who had wealthy parents. So like the grandparents, you know what I mean? Who would actually demand to see their granddaughters every summer. And so like I had a friend who would go for two weeks at a time to San Francisco, come back with all the Lisa Frank trapper keepers and like all the new things. And, you know, that's the one I would borrow clothes from all the time until her mom told her to stop lending me things. 
So there's definitely, you have like classism kind of inside of the church just because of what you came into the Sea Org with money-wise. And my parents had nothing on top of it all. So then I had nothing and I wasn't getting paid. It was just bad luck. Yeah. So family, extended family, did you have relationships with them? Were they also Scientologists? I saw them once we went to New York when I was seven or six and I totally had forgotten about it because they were speaking Spanish and everything and I did not really connect that. They were just people and I was like, oh, like, oh, they live in a house. One of them, one couple, my my mom's brother and wife lived in an actual house. It was like a cute little home and it turns out it was Queens, New York, but I didn't know at the time. And I thought that was exciting, like a house, like I haven't been in a house before. And then my other aunts lived in two bedroom apartments and everybody was kind of crammed in also in Queens. So that was my exposure to them. And they seemed fun and friendly. And they once visited in LA when I was also young. Other than that, that was like the two times I saw them. So I didn't really think about them at all, but they were not Scientologists. So now as an adult and having conversations, they just thought felt like their mom or my mom had just like kind of disappeared because she just kind of like slowly stopped talking to them and like having any connections with them. Yeah. So you mentioned that they were speaking Spanish and he told me off camera something very interesting about finding out your ethnicity. So can you tell everyone that story? Yeah. So being that I wasn't in a family household around my family, I didn't have any idea of what my background was. And it wasn't a big deal until you start watching movies and like, they would be like, who's your favorite actor? And me and my friends would do that. And then they'd be like, oh, yours must be Will Smith because you're black. And I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm black or at least I'm half black because I have tan skin and all of everybody around me. Most, most people at our school were white, was white. And so then I was like, yep, my favorite actor is Will Smith. And then I like told him, asked my friend to braid my hair. So I would have hair like a black person and like tried to start trying to talk like a black person of what I thought it was from movies, uh -huh. which is not a lot. There's not a lot of main characters of black people in those days. And then one day I had a phone call with my mom. And I was like, oh, I braided my hair to my mom. She's like, oh, okay. She's like, like a big braid? I'm like, no, like the little braids, like a black person. She's like, why? And I was like, because cause I'm black. She's like, what? No, you're not. I'm like, well, what am I? <laughs> She's like, you're Puerto Rican. And then the worst thing, because I'm so ed educated, I'm like, Puerto Rican, what's that? <laughs> and she's oh like, God. that means I was born in Puerto Rico. So you'd be Puerto Rican, Commonwealth of the United States. And I'm just like, Oh my gosh, I was so embarrassed and like, yeah. I can't believe now looking back to it's like I'm trying to appropriate a different culture, but I had no idea I wasn't done in any harm. I was just trying to figure out who I was. So that was like very shocking to find that out and to be like, oh, okay. So then I'm more like Catherine Zeta Jones. I'm just trying to like, you know, you always kind of compare yourself with an actor and actress around that time. Wow. It really just seems like you were floating in space, not really knowing who you were, where you came from. You mentioned at one point in your book that you didn't even know your real age. You didn't know that you were legally blind until they took you to the eye doctor. And like, there's so many things that are just being ignored because you're a child in Scientology. Just the level of neglect is astounding. I mean, you were nine turning 10 and you thought you were eight turning nine, right? Yeah. Again, a phone call with my mom. It's never in person, right? <laughs> when I get these bombshells. <laughs> I I had called her to talk about my birthday and what I wanted. And then she, I was like, hey, and I'm turning nine. She's like, no, you're turning 10. And then I was like, what? No, I'm turning nine. And she's like, no, like you were born in 1985. I was just like, what? Uh, my birthday is August 5th, 1985. She's like, no, August 4th. And I'm like, no, I'm August 5th. And she was like, oh, wait, no, you're right. I'm like, Jeez. oh, my, oh my gosh. gosh, mom, I'm about to give me like two bombshells yeah. in one. So then I like have to tell my friends. And meanwhile, I thought I was the youngest of my friend group, which I liked because like, I don't know, I, didn't, I for some reason, I valued it. One of my best friends was a year younger than me already. So then when I found out that she was two years younger than me, I'm like, what? Why am I hanging out with this little girl? 
except for we still we still remain friends. But she's the one that was always the teacher's pet. <laughs> but <laughs> she's very charming. So yeah, I, I had to tell my friends that you know how like kids can be. They're just like, what? So you didn't have a social security number, and now you don't know your age. And I'm just like mortified again. I'm like, oh gosh, <laughs> or my rates, like all these things. How old were you when you found out you were Puerto Rican? I was 12. Okay, so this is all happening fairly around the same time, right? Like all this discovery. Mm -hmm. Well, I found out the night, it was two years later for like, so when I thought I was turning nine, I turned 10. This discovery of my race part was like when I was yet 12. 12. And then when did you find out you haven't you hadn't been seeing your entire life uh hadn't like my vision yeah your vision that was like 10 11 that must have been a, a pretty shocking time then those years when you're just trying to figure out life you're in this ranch you're not really connecting with your parents and just all this information of no this is who you really are how did was that scary to you was it exciting to start to put these pieces together I was very emotionally up and down. Like when I read my journal entries, I would be like really happy one day and then really upset the next day. Um, and it could also just be the hormones at middle school, you know, but also all of those factors that I had. I think that I, I didn't understand, like now I look back and I'm like, I didn't know how to advocate for myself because I'm a child. But all of those things that are happening should have been caught by an adult, right? Like the fact that I had no, not enough underwear or not enough shoes, like I should have been like, I shouldn't have though. It's not my responsibility to an adult. I don't have these things. I need help. But I, I was telling my mom. So really my mom, she would give me a couple dollars here and there and do what she could. But I think it just didn't occur to me to be like, no, this isn't enough. I don't know, to get mad at my mom retroactively, what what would be the point? But like I said, I have other cadet friends, a lot of them with misspelled names, wrong birthdays, things like that. And they were just so overworked, our parents, not to excuse it, but I'm just saying like, it was normal to me. Mm -hmm. All of us were in this like together. And the one thing that I will say that I would I got out of the ranch, even though there was bullying that I, I occurred. I also was really close friends with these people. I grew up with them. I knew them like my sisters and my brothers. And like we had like a lot of joyful, silly moments. So I think that's what keeps me also sane. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't like a big overwhelming bombshell of like horribleness. It was like these moments would happen like here and there of like revelations of my race or my age or or not having shoes or trying to run away because I don't, I was teased because I don't have underwear. But then in between that, it's like we all went on a field trip to the beach and body surfed all day. Like they would try to provide these moments of joy because we all got our stats up, like we earned it. And I was with a bunch of children going through it together. So there was some not to, all of this neglect is not okay. Mm -hmm. But how was I functioning? I was functioning okay because I did have children around me who, who were going through it too, who I was really close with, who I had loved with. Even to this day, the ones who have left the Sea Org, we, have, we are so close. We're like sisters. Yeah. It's so interesting hearing all these different stories. It feels like a culmination or a combination of an orphanage mixed with military, mixed with it sometimes prison. And it's it kind of bounces back between all of those different facets. I mean, they're taking you to the beach. So that's nice. At least you weren't completely just confined to this ranch. You you are getting out and seeing the world. And I was impressed it, in some of the moments where they would take you to the doctor if you needed something. So you weren't completely isolated from the rest of the world. Yet there is still a large amount of neglect. So it seemed like it would just kind of ping pong between those. Yeah, I think once a year, they would try to be like, okay, everybody has to get a physical. So there must have been some sort of legal aspect there. And we all got vaccinated too, which I'm surprised by. I remember getting shots. So we would get that. And then every once in a while, we'd go to the dentist. So there was some care there, but things would get neglected. If you had something like my eyes, probably eventually they're like, wow, she is sitting really close to the TV on Orga Ward night. But it took time because, you know, now like my kids are in school every year, they go through a vision test at school. That's like free unless you opt out. And then obviously at their yearly physicals, they also get checked too. I, I, I don't know if every year we had a yearly physical. So it's possible that's why my eyes weren't noticed. I do know I now I have a 10 year old and that they said that it really picks up with the bad vision at 
10, 11, 12. So probably it just took a while for them to notice, but still not soon enough because I was like reading like this. Yeah. (laughs) There was things that they would do because keep in mind, our parents still are our parents and they would still try to tell them like good works that we're doing. Or we would all go down there and sing them Christmas carols to pack, you know, or they would have us doing missions, which we thought were fun, but it was actually child labor where we would be filing paperwork, but we'd be like loving it because we'd get pizza (laughs) and like listen to K-Rock. Like to us, that was like a fun field trip. Another thing that they would do is camping trips like in the summer. They would try to do things. It was just very haphazard and not, not what you would expect from a childhood. Not enough, but I guess I'm like, at least there was something. And that was for the Pack Ranch. The Int Ranch, which is like where Claire Headley was, They had a school for their children, and that one was way even more strict than ours with even more rules. They couldn't have scented shampoo and conditioner, no having boyfriends and girlfriends. They barely went on field trips. I don't even know if they went on field trips. You have these like levels of horribleness, I guess, (laughs) and ours could have been worse. I'm also an optimist. Like I have friends, though, who are at the ranch who feel a lot of hatred and anger and are really upset about it. And that for me, I'm neutral. I'm like... There are some moments that are really crappy, but I also had a lot of funny friendship moments. It's not great. I'm not neutral about it. I'm not saying that should have happened, but I don't hold on to this like anger, I guess. Yeah. And then I also have friends who were like, I actually loved the ranch. It wasn't until I was in the Sea Org where they tried to like just make me work, 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 work that I was unhappy. You always have that. Like everybody experiences things differently. I think that because I'm generally a positive person, even though all of these things, like I know when you're listening to my book, you're probably like, why is she so happy? (laughs) Or like, why does she act like this is normal? Because I would always try to look at the bright side kind of, or like try to twist it so it was okay. And and it's probably a survival mechanism. Because now, honestly, if I want to be real, I look at how I nurture my own children and how much I care for them and how much I'm like, oh, what do you like to do? What What is your interest? And how much my husband and I are so involved in what they're feeling and how we have these conversations. None of that happened for me. And that's really sad. Yeah. And, I, and it's, it's strange that I could be like, oh, but it's fine. I know it's not fine. Like it's, it would take a really strong person to not be mentally affected by that. And I think I just happened to be strong. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think you were strong, optimistic, and it also that was your coping mechanism is finding the bright side. Some people, their coping mechanism is to dissociate and some people, they would rather be angry. And it's, I think everyone just reacts differently. And so for you, it probably felt good to find all of the good things and make the best of it when you could. And that's totally fine. So I think, yeah. And and also we remember things in certain ways too. Like I don't have, if I think back to my childhood as a whole, just completely bird's eye view uh, growing up in Mormonism, mainstream Mormonism. It's like, yeah, I had a good childhood. And then I sit down and I pick out all the things. I just recently did a three hour interview with an ex-Mormon podcaster on Mormon stories. And I was like, oh yeah, there's a lot of stories here that are not great. (laughs) And that really illustrate the emotional and psychological damage that Mormonism caused me. But I didn't see it that way as a kid because that was just my reality. It was just something I was living in. It was just part of who I was. So it makes sense to have these different perspectives and it's okay to have that. So I want to move to the Sea Org then because you start getting rebellious and then I want to know what was the catalyst, the main catalyst that made you want to leave? In the Sea Org, constantly I was told you are too loud, too too much to stop flirting with boys. I was always called a flirt but I was friendly. It's just friendly. <laughs> like I would just talk to everybody, girls and boys, but obviously I would flirt with the boys because I'm 14, 15. I was kind of coming into my own. I was an ugly duckling growing up. I was all of a sudden kind of getting like positive attention from boys. And it was so different for me and unique. So of course I was engaging on it. And for me, again, like I said, growing up, I didn't feel like I got a lot of uh, good attention a lot of time. Um, so like to get some sort of good attention was nice. Um, but I was always getting in trouble for that in the Sea Org. And I was also, I mean, like there's an instance that, for example, it's in my book where I'm walking with my childhood friend, the one that was my boyfriend, he was 12, but we're just really good friends and we're 15 and we're walking through like a skyway. It connects the church buildings and it's big windows and people on Elburn Harbor way, which is the, the street, 
outside could totally look up and see us. And we like start arguing over who's stronger and we start like full on wrestling. We're in Sea Org uniform and I like tackle him to the ground. That's how oblivious I was to Sea Org rules and conduct. I was just like, I don't care, I'm having fun. It's lunch hour, doesn't matter. And then we get caught and we get yelled at. And <laughs> I was doing stuff like that constantly thinking it wasn't a big deal. But I, it, it was like, that's totally not what a Sea Org member should be like. And it was just weighing on me. And I was like, maybe I'm not meant to be in the Sea Org. Maybe I'm meant to just be a Scientologist. Somebody who just takes services from the Church of Scientology and like doesn't have to act like a Sea Org member. Maybe that would be better. And then another huge part that was starting to come to play is being 15, 16. I'm aware of this rule that they made. I don't know if you've heard of this in the 80s where they said no more Sea Org members cannot have children. Have you heard this yet? Yeah. Yeah. And I loved kids. I, I would go to the um, church events and go in the child care room. And my mom was always in charge of the child care or in the child care room too. So I'd see my mom then too and get some mom time. But I would hold all the babies and I loved it. They were so snuggly. So I was beginning to realize I'm like, I actually want to have kids. And I'm also not doing very well in the Sea Org. I also just want to have a life. I don't like my post as rudiments registrar. You know, there was no joy that I was getting of being in the Sea Org, but I kept trying to reinforce that. They would have what's called Sea Org Day, where all of the Sea Org members would be celebrated. We'd have a fun day at the beach. This happens only once a year, to be clear, where they would take us all somewhere fun. And then that happened when reinvigorate me and they have a ceremony or they like celebrate all the good works of any Sea Org members that are in ethics and working hard and seeing my friends go up on stage and get these awards. I'm just like, Oh, like I can do it. So then I'll like reconvince myself. I should do it. I can be a good Sea Org member. I can help save the world. And then I would be hit by boredom, honestly, like them not in this <laughs> task that they give me. And I'm like, I just don't want to do it. So how I talk myself out of the Sea Org is basically just, I advocated for myself and was like, I do want to have a fun life. Maybe I could have like a fun life, have kids because I need to meet my husband. I can't just leave and go like, I want to have a career and a life. And then I would meet my husband and then I would have children. Like I'm aware of that timeline. And I was only 15. So I was like, maybe I could go to high school. So I started to, to dream big basically yeah. for that for that type of environment that I was in. And it takes a lot. They do sex checking on you, which is when they have you do a confessional before you leave. They also, if you are somebody who was unlucky enough to have done a lot of courses, I had not because I kept skipping out and not doing courses. They would bill you for those courses. So a lot of cadets or seagrammers don't want to leave because you know you're going to get what's called a freeloader's debt, which could be upwards of $50,000, which is ridiculous. So I left with a $5,000 debt, even though I, I was only... I won't say how old I was. So that's like a surprise. I was, I will just say I was young under 18 and they give you a debt when you leave and just send you off. So it was, it took like a year of like figuring it all out. And then I was, I decided I was like, I just got to go. And then that even took another couple months. Cause then I had to get the sec checking. My parents had to find a place for me to go. And yeah. Okay. So you leave the Sea Org and they actually let you leave and then you're trying to go about life just as a regular Scientologist taking courses. And so were you able to actually go to high school or public school? I wish that was how it worked. I am going to write a second book about the journey of being a Scientologist and how I left Scientology itself, because this first book is how I left the Sea Org. And that and you just it's like immersing you in the environment of the Sea Org and what a cadet is like. That's the point of my story. Um, the good and the bad, gray, white, black. And then the second part of my journey is how do you leave an actual cult like that mind indoctrination? Cause I totally believe in Scientology. And the first step was like going to high school. High school is not like the movies, big shock. <laughs> <laughs> so that was very <laughs> upsetting to me. Wait, what were some of the things that you expected based on seeing it in the movies that did not come to fruition? <laughs> okay. I thought that it was a lot cleaner, I thought there were nicer buildings. I thought that there was <laughs> more white people because they only portray like white people in these movies, generally, unless it's Save the Last Dance. Um, so I was ended up in Florida at a predominantly Hispanic school, which like at least I got to be exposed to my culture and like Dominican, Cuban. I didn't even know like about Cubans. It was very interesting. So I got to meet all these different people, but I didn't really know where my niche was because I used to be like, punk rocker girl with dickies converse and like that was not the vibe and 
Tampa, Florida. So then when I do find those punk rockers, they smoke pot. And I'm just like, drugs are bad for you. Like, I'm definitely like, oh, these aren't right people. I don't smoke pot. So I was kind of like a loose, like, leaf just floating around. I had friends in each class, but nobody I like I connected with. And I didn't feel comfortable in my aunt's house. She was like a very Christian woman. She would go to these big mega churches where they like sing and dance. And like, you would think I would be kind of used to it from like the Scientology events, but it was about God and Jesus. And I didn't grow up knowing about that. And they'd be praying. It was very like uh, uncomfortable for me. And I just, I think she wasn't quite ready to take on another teenager as well. My cousin was still living with her who was my age, luckily, and but we were, we had to share a room. It was only a two bedroom apartment, but we got along great. So I just felt like it wasn't my place to be. So then I went to stay with some aunts in New York for a while. But I was just like, by then other cadets were leaving the Sea Org and they're all ending up in LA. They would like get sent away by security. It's securities who checks you out of the Sea Org. They would get sent away and but we'd all, they were all coming trickling back because everybody just wanted to be in LA and together. So I managed to find myself back in LA. I managed to get an apartment with a bunch of other cadets who left. And we have the best time of our lives. We're all pretty broke, but we, and we're all crammed in a two bedroom. Eventually we start to get our own places, but like at some point there's like eight of us in a two bedroom with a rich Scientologist kid. So the Scientology kid was in the Sea Org with us, became friends with us, left the Sea Org, but her parents or out of the sea are going to have money and they pay for her. She had a two bedroom and she just got to go on course. Like that's the life she got to live. But we all had to get jobs right away. So we all found jobs and we have money, but like just enough to like pay for gas to get like to and from work and for ramen noodles. Yeah. But oh my gosh, we were having so much fun because for the first time in our lives, we got to pick what we wanted to do, where we wanted to be. And like, we were all drinking underage. I was only 17 at this time. It was great. And I still consider myself a Scientologist, but I didn't do any Scientology. You know, I never did any courses. I had my free letter debt, didn't have any money to pay that off. And honestly, I didn't really want to. So I was like, that was how everything was great and dandy though. And I was happy in it. How did I come out of Scientology is after a few years of that, I was randomly, I was working for what, what they wouldn't call it a Scientology school, but it was, it's called Delphi Academy. It's a private school. I was a teacher there not getting paid a lot, but I love my job. I love kids. And then I got called into the church randomly and they sit me down and I'm like, oh, I'm going to tell them all about my good works at Delphi. They're going to hear about how much I've changed. And instead I get told, you are suppressing your dad and brother who are still in the Sea Org. My brother, older brother is starting to get sick. You're, we think you're the suppressive person. Oh, And I was just like shocked. And I'm like, you're saying I'm evil, that I'm the bad person because they believe in like people who are like suppressive, who are like basically bad forces on people. Like I could have the power to make my brother sick. So they're like, you're not allowed to talk to your family anymore until you get, we get this sorted out. Cause I would see my parents every Sunday morning still. Like I would drive to pack base and pick them up when we go to brunch and my brother and my sister. So I was just so up, like just, I was bawling, so upset. And then I left. And then I had to process it on my own because you can't talk negatively about Scientology. All of my friends, I can't talk to them about it. And it was, it was so hard. And I was, and I just couldn't believe that I couldn't talk to my family and that they thought I could be like a suppressive person. And if one knowledge report was written on me, I'd be declared a suppressive. And I hadn't even done anything wrong. And so then I was just holding on to that. And meanwhile, I had started dating a non Scientologist very like casual, but together, like exclusive. And he was like, Hey, you don't seem like your normal, like happy self. Is something going on? And I was just like, Oh, no, no, it's fine. He's like, just so you know, like I grew up Christian. I'm not going to ever be a Scientologist. So if it has anything to do with that, I don't know how he knew to say this, but he's like, there's anything to do with that. You could tell me. And I was like, Oh my gosh. Well, if he's never going to be a Scientologist, cause the worry is I don't want to stop him from his bridge to total freedom. But if he's never going to be a Scientologist, then I'm not stopping him. So then I told him about, about everything that was going on and me talking about it kind of made it more real, like how horrific and horrible that these people could do something like that and say that to me and say that to my parents that I'm like an evil force on them. But my husband, or he's my husband now, oh, <laughs> my boyfriend at the time, <laughs> he was just like uh, listening and he didn't attack anybody. If he started attacking the church, I would have put my walls up. But like, you know what? It's just that one person. 
not all of the churches like that. So I told him all this and he heard it and he was there for me and that was enough. And then as time went on, like I would just start to notice things that were like not okay about the church. So for example, I took him to the basics event, which was like this big deal. They're re-releasing all these books that Scientologists had studied for years. But apparently all those books were wrong all of a sudden. And now they all need to buy these new set of books. And I was like, what a whole load of crap. Like even I could see this because I'm watching it next to my boyfriend next to me. I'm just like, oh my God, like this is so money hungry. It's so obvious. I couldn't believe it. And as we were walking out, my friends that I grew up with would like, but Catherine, cash your credit card, cash your credit card. These glazed looks on their eyes. Like they looked insane. And I was like, hello to you too. Like it's been a couple of months. How's it going? They're like, have you bought your basics yet? Have you bought your basics yet? And I knew they're under so much pressure to make a goal. Like they get so much pressure at these events to sell, 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 cash or credit card. Don't accept no for an answer. And I, and I saw this, this, all this group mentality of trying to sell these basics. And I like I looked at my husband. I was like, Oh my gosh. And we get in the car and we're driving out of the parking garage. And like literally a SIG member leans on the hood of the car and they're like, cash or credit card. Oh my gosh. <laughs> And he, the guy put his arm inside to the window so Ryan could not roll up the window. And my husband's just like, or boyfriend at the time, he says this very calmly, if you don't get your hand out of the window, I'm going to call the cops. And the guy's like, because oh, you never call the cops in Scientology. And I was just like, damn. I was like, good for you, babe. This sounds like the walking dead of Scientology. Like the zombies are like, cash your credit card. <laughs> it was. It was the eye opener. That was the eye opener. Like it was... The part, the piece of my parents being told out to talk to me, which by the way, a couple months later, my sister called me and she was like, we got it sorted out. You're allowed to see them again, but because we have to all get our bone marrows checked to see if we're a match for my brother. Mm -hmm. And because he was really sick. So he needed like a bone marrow transplant. So that's why they lifted it. Because they're like, we need her to be here to see if she's a match. At this point, he's getting a life or death procedure, you know? And so then I was like allowed to be there. Um, so then I was like, that had all been happening. I was back in with my family. So then to go to this event though, was like a, like that little tiny chink that they had was just kind of like ripped. And I was just like, I wonder what's on the internet. It's like, cause you do not go on the internet. If you are a Scientologist, they'll tell you like, they're all lying. Everybody's lying. Don't go on the internet. They're going to try to get you out of Scientology. It's all just fake media. So then I went. I went online and I started reading on Xenu.net and like all these other websites, like the message boards, stories about people being disconnected. And I was just like, this is not good. <laughs> I was like, this is not a good organization. And then I started reading about Alvin Hubbard and all the lies about that we've been taught about his life, how he fabricated his like whole autobiography. And it was just so eye opening. And from there, like I just kept doing more and more research. But meanwhile, I have to keep it to myself because I can't say anything in front of my parents. But I could tell Ryan about all this. So that was nice. Yeah. So there's my journey. And like I get out of it, but I'm still best friends with people who are hardcore Scientologists. So I just can never say anything negative about Scientology out of the fear of losing them. And then my parents, too. Like I was starting to write this book when I was 20, 21. And I told my mom because I had. I had finally left Delphi, the school I was at, because I was so underpaid and miserable. And I got a better paying personal assistant job that was part time and I still got paid more. And now I started working on my book, this book, The Bad Cadet. But I didn't have the title, but I was just putting it all down, just like barfing all my thoughts on my page and copying my journal into, into it. And my mom said, when I said to her out that I was been working on writing, she said, you better not be writing about Scientology. Oh, wow. That was her first reaction. Because she knew, like, if people read about it, like, she, even she knows it's not going to be good. And my book is not even attacking Scientology. I think you'd agree, right? Yeah. It's me just telling my story and you could take what you want out of it. It's just, it is what it is. How I was raised was, was how I was raised. And I just want people to form their own opinions about it. And, you know, most opinions are I was horribly neglected as a child. And I was forced into lab a hard labor and no education. I was putting all this on paper in my book, but even then I was like, I can't lose my mom. Like she actually would come out to visit me when I moved. I ended up moving out of LA, California to be near my husband's family in Minnesota. And she 
would come visit once a year, like she was, and we would talk on the phone a lot. And my dad too, of course. But you know, I told you I had this like bond with my mom and my sister and I were actually getting to know each other because she would come too. I never grew up with her. So I was getting to know my sister. So I was like, I'll never write this book because I know they would disconnect from me. They have to, it's just the way it is. And then um, Leah Remini was having her, was starting to film her second season of her show. And my best friend, Miriam, and our other friend at the time, we we're going to go on the show. And I found out about, or they told me about it. I was like, okay, like, yeah, that's your truth. Do what you got to do. Like, tell what you want to say, what you want to say. Like, it's hopefully going to be really freeing for you. Obviously, very scary, though. Like, because people in Scientology talk out can get attacked and smear campaigns, like, really bad. And then my best friend, who's in my book growing up, the one who's like a little bit of a bully, but also very charming and really cute. She called me one day and was like, I heard that, that Miriam and our, and our other friend are going to be on the show. Is this true? And I had been wanting to talk to have a real actual conversation about what Scientology is. And she, her walls are so up on that. And she would like was on course getting auditing, but she was so sheltered. Like she was hitting, coming up on her 30th birthday and like hadn't traveled anywhere. Like she hadn't done anything. Like she was just in this little bubble. So I've been wanting to like kind of get her out. And I was like, Oh, she's actually asking me a question I can answer honestly. And I was like, yep, they're going on it because the stuff happened to them and this in the church. I'm like hoping they can listen to it. Maybe they could do an apology or just something to take responsibility for it because this is what happened to them and it's not okay. And that's the truth. And then she was like, but do you know, like if they were like paid to be on the show? And I was like, that is not a normal response to hearing this like big news. I'm pretty sure to this day that she was in an MAA's office, which is like an ethics person. And they were standing with her and she was like on speaker being coached to get information about my friends and what were, what was going to be happening on the show. And so then I go into panic mode and I'm like, please don't report this. Even though it's already too late, I'm realizing somebody's there. I'm like, I could lose my parents over this. I was just trying to have a conversation with you. And she's like, yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. I'm like, come on. Like, you know that this is a big deal. Like I was just, you asked me a question. I was just trying to let you know, like, it's okay for people to talk about what happened to them growing up. It's not a big deal. Like you don't need to write a report. She's like, okay, it's fine. I'm like, oh my gosh, we hang up. And then I'm like, Go to, go to like text her in a response, text her, call her, goes to voicemail, can't reach her. She's not responding. Go to her social media. She's blocked me on everything. This is like my best friend growing up. Oh. And then I don't hear from my family at all. I try to call them. I, they don't have a cell phone I could call directly. So I used to leave messages with the org, the church org. Can't keep, keep on not hearing back. And then my sister calls me finally and she says, I heard that you knew about them. How could you know about it and not write a report about my friend Miriam and her our friend going on Leah Remini's show? And I'm like, I didn't, th like, why would I write a report on them? They're, first of all, like, they could do whatever they want. I'm just a friend of theirs. And also, why can't they speak their truth? And she's like, well, it's just it's really hurtful. And she's like, and you've said comments to me before, like comparing the Sea Org to 1984. I was like, ooh, I did do that. <laughs> but... It was a, I was just trying to get like little nuggets in there, you know, yeah. like cause she said she was reading 1984 and I said, don't you find it very similar? She said, what do you mean? I said, well, you guys write reports on each other all the time, like a big brother and there's cameras everywhere. And she's like, no, it's not like big brother. I'm like, okay. So I had said like slightly pointed things to her and she's like, I just, it's really, I think we just need some space right now. Mom and dad too. I guess it's what they say instead of disconnecting. And I was like, okay, like, I, I, if you guys need to like take a break, that's fine. But I, this is, we could still be family. We could be on different sides. They knew I wasn't a Scientologist, but they didn't, the, this part that I knew of side people who were talking about their time at Scientology, that part, not allowed, I guess, right? Cause I was just, I was shocked. We hang up and I'm like, oh no. I'm like, well, hopefully it's just like a few week break, like the last time. And it's a few months later, Christmas is coming. And normally I'd always go to Palm Springs with Ryan's family. And then we would drive to LA to see my parents and my sister. But then there's, they're not responding, not re responding to anything, any calls, emails. So then I have a final email and I reread it recently when I was on a girl's trip with my cadet friends that I grew up with. Cause we each have these stories of disconnection very similar, but very different. And I'm just like, Hey guys, I can't believe that this is happening. Like you guys aren't talking to me anymore. I can't believe we're doing this again. After when I was 
when I was 21 years old and you guys did this to me. This is so upsetting to me. I was going to try to see you guys in LA. And then I'm just like, if you guys ever want to reach out, I'm here. But this is like really sad. Like we could still have each other in each other's lives. And then I said like, I love you. And then I never heard from them. That was it. So it was a, it was a long winter because I was at that time. I also had just, I had baby twins and my mom had come out and my dad for like two weeks to stay with me because I had, I had convinced them. The only reason why I was able to get them to even come that time, this is before everything happened with Leah Remini show was because I had said it's out PR for you to not come. Cause I know of so many people who said when they had twins, their mom comes to stay with them. So it's out public relations for you to not be here. Cause I knew, I know the plugs that they need to put in their CSW, you know, the request to leave. And then I've come to find out even later that before my mom even was able to come, she had to get sex checked to make sure she was coming back. I found out from somebody who's recently left the CR that he was her auditor for that. It was hard to lose them. And then after processing it, I was like, well, I have this whole book I've been like putting on paper on my computer, like 150,000 words. I've always felt like this is a story that needs to be told about the cadets of the Sea Org. And I'm like, I think I'm going to be the person to tell it because what have I got to lose now, you know? And I want, I think I have a story that's different than what's out there in the sense that it's very YA. It's very like young adult, so young people can read it. I write it in an engaging way of actually yeah. describing what's happening around me, giving dialogue so you could really be immersed in that world so that people could really understand what a cult is like and what it takes for somebody to leave, but how much self-talk that somebody does to keep themselves in. So I'm hoping that's what I achieved. And it's been, it was very scary coming out. I almost post wrote my book anonymously out of fear of being attacked online and social media, yeah. getting my neighborhood papered with like lies about me. But I realized I'm like, what can they say about me? I left when I was 16. I'm like, there's not really a lot. You, could, like, you can't really yeah, attack you can come up with. <laughs> yeah. So, and then my a friend of mine had told me like she had been speaking out a cadet friend and she was like, it's so freeing to just have your name out there and not have to play this game anymore with some people who are on your social media who are still Scientologists like monitoring you or acting like you still are okay with Scientology when they're like, um, when it's not okay. Like they do so many things like disrupting children, families and pulling them apart over and over and again. The disconnection policy is very harsh. Um, so yeah, and it's been really good actually, like speaking out and going on these podcasts. The first time I did it, I was like sweating. I was like, oh, <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but now I've, I'm, it's, it's almost been a year. I released in April last year and I feel like this is okay. Like this is cool. It's like my life's purpose. Like it's a cool thing for me to have done, like make something of my childhood, tell a story, share it to others. And hopefully it give some like clarity to some people about what it's like to be a child in the Sea Org. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on and sharing. It's so interesting to hear from your perspective. So how you're doing now, so you still haven't been in contact with your family, they've completely cut you off? Yeah, so they completely cut me off. But then Aaron Smith Levin had like, knew of somebody who's being rescued from the Sea Org. And they knew my where my parents were. And so they had the number. So when they got out, they gave me the number. So Whoa. I was able to call and I talked to my parents, which was really like, because they turned out they were no longer on the pack base, which is why I couldn't call them because the pack base, you only could call the church. Now they're in an apartment building for people who are elderly because they're like approaching, they're in their seventies now. So I was able to talk to them. At that time I was panicked because I had heard that like my dad's diabetes was really bad and that he was really sick and that my mom had dementia on early onset dementia. And I was like freaking out, but I talked to them and they actually sounded really good in the sense of like, they aren't dying, you know, yeah. and was able to like hear about how they're doing. Still not, I don't think they have a great quality of life, but I was at least able to hear their voices. And then I was like, reminded my mom, I'm like, Hey, I know that I, we have, might have differences of opinion on religion, but like, I'm still here. I still love you. Like you guys are still able to come visit. Like, why can't we be in each other's lives? And my mom, literally her words were, are you still in contact with Miriam? Yeah, but that doesn't matter. We could still be together. She's like, well, let me check with my ethics officer. Oh, That's no. how much she is so used to somebody telling her what to do, what she can and can't do. Like, even though she hasn't heard from me in seven years, she's still like, let me talk with my ethics officer. 
So then we hang up. I'm like, okay, I love you. Hang up. And then I'm just like, wait, is she going to talk to my ethics officer? She, that ethics officer is going to tell them about me and my book. And it's going to come out a lot worse from the ethics officer than me. So I call back and I managed to get, reach her again. And I'm like, okay, mom, remember I, I told you I was writing a book a long time ago? And she was like, <laughs> so like took a breath. I was like, so I wrote the book called The Bad Cadet. And she was like, is it attacking Scientology or something like that? And I was like, it's not attacking it. It's just telling my story of growing up. And I'm like, it's called The Bad Cadet. Remember what a bad cadet I was? And she was like, yeah. <laughs> like, and then I'm like, and, but she was definitely very subdued. And I was like, oh, no, like she knows what this means. But I was just like, I'm like, I just want to let you know. But again, I love you. You're welcome to come stay with me. Like, I love you guys. And please call me. And she's like, okay, I got to go. And then we hung up. And then I told my brother about it, who's out of the Sea Org and not in the Scientology. So he tried to call and he just got disconnected number. And then I was like, what? And then I tried to call and the phone line had been unplugged. Wow. So th I haven't talked to them since. I don't even know if they're in the same building. That's such a gift, though, that you were able to, that Aaron was able to connect you with someone who could connect you with her. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I, I'm sure it must have been a really difficult conversation and I can't even imagine all of the feelings that you were going through, the ups and the downs and the disappointment and being happy to hear from her or ha happy to know she's okay. So, wow, that's, I'm so sorry that you have to go through that. How frustrating and you can tell you still really love and care for your mom and I'm sure your dad too. And it must be really hard to know that she can't have a relationship with your beautiful kids, your three kids. I know she's missed so much. And like, she like loved them so much. And my dad too, like I have pictures of them holding them as little one month old babies and my little three year old singing songs to them. Cause he loves theater. He still does, which is amazing. He's 10. So that'll be fun for you on your journey is like to see the personality of your baby as they grow older because my 10 year old is still very into theater and music and he was even when he was little but they had this relationship with my children and they've chosen to lose that completely over they chose they choose they chose Scientology over me and my children. Yeah, that's so hard. And it just speaks to the brainwashing and the programming that they've clearly been under since you were born. And it's so hard to see past that. And you know, because you've been in that situation where you can't see it until like probably when you got your first glasses and then you can't unsee it and you go, oh, what have I been doing? How did I miss this? But it's almost impossible to really see everything that's in front of you until you have some sort of emotional break or until you really decide to be open-minded. And it takes so much to get to that point. So in some ways, I can't blame your parents. And then in other ways, of course, it's terrible and it's tragic and it's really sad that that's the way it is. Yeah, exactly. So like, I'm not angry at my parents because I know that they're just under undue influence. Like they've just been indoctrinated to what they think. And that if they do want to leave, like I'm here, I would still be here and love them. It's sad, obviously, and disappointing. But I also it's it, I know how much influence Scientology has on these people. Yeah. Well, you seem to be doing well now, telling your story. Everyone go read The Bad Cadet. You have these children and your amazing husband. I would give him a hug if he was here. <laughs> I love that he supported you through all of that and was there for you. That's so amazing. Is there anything else that you wanted to share about how you're doing now or anything that brings you joy and peace? I'm doing great. I'm in Minnesota and I'm, I am raising my three boys and I just, I, I rebel in like being able to make my own choices for myself every day all day <laughs> it's the nicest feeling to not have someone telling you what to do all the time yeah definitely well this has been so great thank you so much for coming on and sharing and before we go i need the linda listen moment your sassy statement to anyone who's pissed you off or something inspirational okay all right so listen linda if somebody is telling you what to do all the time and they're like, don't look over there. That information's bad or no good. You got to just take a chance and take a peek and see what they're saying is wrong because that's how you get out. It's like, don't believe 
everything only from one source. You need multiple sources and then you can form your own opinion. Yes. <laughs> I hope that was a good one. <laughs> Absolutely. That's such good advice. You have to hear both sides of the story. I think that's such a good point when someone says, well, you can't look over there. Don't look over there. Don't look over there. There's probably a reason that you should go look over there. Exactly. Unless it's like the normal boundaries of like children don't look at that website or something. But like I'm right. talking exactly. about exactly as an adult, exactly. when somebody's telling you one piece of news, you got to get all the news because even now, like media is so everybody could just look at their own filtered media of news and then you're not going to get the full picture. Yeah, I agree. Great advice. Well, this has been awesome. Guys, if you want to go follow her over on Instagram and on Twitter, it's at The Bad Cadet. You can check out her book. I'll put all the links in the description. Do you have any other final thoughts before we go? Thanks, everyone, for hearing my story. I do respond to DMs if you wanted to ask any questions. And I also have Audible available now that just came out a couple days ago. Super proud that I managed to get that out. So yeah, that's how I've been listening to it. So highly recommend. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, of course. So everyone, if you're still listening, leave those words of encouragement down below for Catherine. It means a lot. Our guests do read the comments and it helps boost the algorithm. If you want to support the podcast, you can like, share, subscribe, all the YouTube things. And you can go check out our website, quiltsofconsciousness.com. We have some merch under the merch tab. And what else? You can become a patron if you'd like, patreon.com slash quiltsofconsciousness. You can come to Costa Rica, hang out with us in real life. We're going to do some fun stuff horseback riding to waterfalls and spa treatments oh i can't wait it's at the end of august so if you want to check that out you can find that in the description as well and i think that's it so if you like this video i will link two more down here below that you can check out and until next time follow your highest excitement be conscious and be well <laughs>